Good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. I am Pastor Richard T. Wade, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today. I pray the Word of God can speak to you, and the Holy Spirit make it real to you. Now, a pre-recorded message from Cornerstone Assemblies of God. Don't go too far from victory there. The Lord is ministering, and I'm not here to stop anything. I'm here to carry it a little further. Uh, the Lord's told me to go ahead and preach what I need to preach. I've been praying, saying, Lord, do I just not preach today? And he said, no, preach, but make it plain. And so... Tracy came to me in a moment ago and she said the Lord had showed her the heavenly war. That there is a battle taking place in here right now. But the protection is yours. God is here. He's here to deliver He's here to set free. He is your protection. Surrender to what you hear him saying. Press in and allow him to fight for you. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. That's what you've been doing. You're in this vicious cycle of figuring it out on your own. <coughs> Stop it. There is an enemy. His name is Satan. There are demons, powers, and principalities that are on a mission to steal your soul. And they've been being pretty good at their job. But the power and the presence of the Lord is in this place to break that bondage and to set you free if you will receive what the Spirit has been depositing into you in the last few minutes. He's been downloading. He's been talking to you. So now you have, you have a responsibility. Are you going to allow what he's been speaking to resonate and then you act upon it? Or are you just going to suppress it and go on about your own way? Listen, going about your own way will lead to destruction. But if you will pause and listen and do the word of the Lord that is deposited. I'm going to preach to you, yes, and this is the word of God. But I'm talking about something in the spiritual realm that's been happening in the last 10 minutes. There's been a deposit. The Holy Ghost has been speaking to you. Hold on to that. Stand in that. Because that is God protecting you. He's protecting you. Hallelujah. Huh. I love it when the Lord orchestrates church. Not knowing what the worship team is going to say or sing. To hear God say, look, you need to go up there and, and testify for Leanne because she's not going to. And I love her. That's what I heard. Testify for Leanne because I love her. And then a tongue and interpretation to come and say, I am ever with you and I love you. And then Tracy comes to me. She says, I'm seeing a war. But the protection of the Lord is here if they will surrender. And the next song they sing is victory. I'm going to see a victory. We can't do that. Some of y'all might be smart enough, but let me tell you, your pastor ain't. I'm not smart enough to orchestrate something like that. But the Spirit of God is speaking to His people today. And now as your pastor, I'm going to ask you the question, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> because here's the title of this morning's sermon. Whoever hears these sayings. Whoever hears these sayings. So the Lord's asking you to listen this morning. He's speaking to you. Are you hearing him? 
Are you hearing him? Let's go to the Father. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you glory and honor in this place. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We humbly bow in your presence, and we just ask, Lord, that you have your way. Not my will, but thine be done. Through the working of your Holy Spirit, empower us to not only hear your word, but to do your word. Father, we thank you for reminding us that you are always with us and that you love us. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you are our protection and we will see a victory. Father, now help us to hear, hear your word that we may act upon it. Empty me of myself, Lord. Send the true teacher and preacher. Anoint me, Lord God, to clearly articulate your word and all of those who are in my hearing to receive it. Give us an ear to hear. A heart to receive. And a resolve to do. And we ask these things in your most holy name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated if you can. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pick up in verse 7 of chapter 7, uh, ladies in the bird's nest up there. I know I told you verse 1, but we're going to pick up in verse 7. Matthew 7, starting in verse 7. Over the last several services, I guess three weeks now, we have been going through the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We, we broke 7 apart and have kind of covered some of it out of order. Last Sunday night on our graduate night, we covered verses 15 through 23 of chapter 7. I was, I was planning on picking up in ch- verse 1. But I believe for this morning and where we are and what the Lord is saying to the church that that needs to wait until probably Wednesday. But in verse 7, Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. What man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, Everything you would like men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So this morning I want us to pick up here in verse 7 and I want to talk to you for a little bit about asking and seeking, knocking on the door, seeking God for all that he has for you. All the while, I want you to keep these four words in your mind because this is where we will end this morning. Whoever hears these sayings. Whoever hears these sayings. And so Jesus, sitting here in front of or standing in front of upwards of 10,000 people, on a hillside by the Sea of Galilee, just outside of Capernaum, preaching this sermon that we now call Sermon on the Mount or Beatitudes. He has now walked through a great deal in his sermon before he gets to this point. He has right off the bat told them, blessed, 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 blessed. 
nine times, blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed are the humble, blessed are the meek, blessed are the kind, blessed are the pure, blessed, blessed. And so when we become obedient doers of the word, when we become obedient to the will of God, when we orchestrate our lives according to what he tells us to do, not what we want to do, there are blessings that follow. He has taught us about cutting off our right hand or our eye that causes us to sin. He's talking about separating ourselves from the things that do so easily beset us. Those things that can draw us away from God, we've got to cut them out of our lives. He's talked to us about our money and that we make sure that we know where we're putting our treasure because our heart follows our treasure. He's talked to us about anxiety and fear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. I'm God. I clothe the lilies in the valley and I feed the sparrows. How much more will I not feed and clothe you? Don't stress over tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough to deal with. You got enough problems right here, right now to be worried about what you have no control over. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. So this has been his sermon to this point, that you're salt and light, that you're a city on a hill to guard your eyes because they are the light of your soul and what you let in will begin to contaminate you. And then in verses 1 through 6, and I'll take this for Wednesday, but he deals with judgment. That we won't be so concerned about the speck in our next door neighbor's eyes that we forget the log that's in our own eye. That'll be Wednesday's teaching. But this morning now we've got Jesus teaching and he's saying, Look, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to them who knocks, it is opened to them. The Greek tense of the verb here is talking about a, a carrying on, a continuation. You don't just ask God once. Keep on asking him. Live a life where you stay before the Father with your need with what's going on with your life. Not that you're begging Him to answer you, but that you are reminding Him and you're reminding yourself that you are fully dependent upon Him. You go to Him and you say, Lord, I need your help in this situation. And maybe you don't hear the answer you're looking for. Well, listen, tomorrow morning you get up and you say, Lord, I need help in this situation. And it's not that you're begging Him, but you're reminding yourself. Remember, you took it to the Father yesterday. Keep it there today. Don't try to pick it back up and figure it out on your own. Don't try to become your own solution. He is the solution. Continue to ask and you will receive now I know there are already minds twirling saying yeah well I've asked for something and I've not received it I understand guess what that means you need to keep asking you need to keep asking and then others say well I asked and I got something but I didn't get what I asked for well, God knows best, and you probably didn't need what you was asking for anyhow. You probably ought to give him glory for the salvation that he's brought to you. Give him glory for the protection that he's provided for you because you were asking for something that was going to send you down a black hole, and he didn't answer that prayer but give you something else instead because he knew that's really what you need anyhow. But that comes with the seeking him. See, when you seek him, you're going to find him. When you, when you find him, you really get what you really got. See, it's like when you're looking for treasure. Well, you might have this image in your mind of what this treasure is going to look like. Oh, I got this treasure map, and I'm about to find this treasure. I bet 
you know, it's a big old gold piece. And it, hopefully it's from some sort of, you know, Spanish, you know, shipwreck. And so maybe it's going to have some, some Spanish language on it. Maybe it's going to have this marking of this conquistador on it or, or something like that. And so you have this mind and you're, you're setting out for this treasure. And then you find the treasure. But it's not what you had envisioned. Well, see, it's not that you didn't find the treasure. You just had a wrong perception of what you was looking for. So when we seek God, we're going to find him. But sometimes we're looking for a slot machine or a vending machine that we can just put in our prayer needs and pump in a few quarters and hit a button, and he's going to give us whatever it is we asked for. No, he's holy and he's pure and he's just. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. He knows what's best for us. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. And he knows our end. He knows. Trust him. When you've sought him, when you've been faithful, when you've done all that you know to do, when you've done the word of God, but you're not receiving the result that you believe you should be receiving, maybe God is showing you something. I say maybe. Because I'm not up here to speak directly to any one situation. I'm up here to tell you to seek him. He can speak to you. Seek him, you can find him. Knock and it'll be opened to you. It's a continual, every day get up and ask him something. Every day get up and look for his will. Every day knock on that door of whatever is blocking the blessings of God, whatever is blocking the blessings of your children and your grandchildren. I know most of you in here, so I know you got some bonehead kids and grandkids that need to get right with Jesus. I know that. Well, every day you knock on that door, Every day, knock on that door. Well, I've been knocking on that door for a decade, preacher. Well, are they set free yet? No. Are they still sucking air? Yeah. Well, then there's still an opportunity. Keep knocking on that door. Well, I asked God to, this in prayer 10 years ago. That's the reason I brought up the Greek tense of this. Is because it's truly saying continually, continually ask, continually seek, continually knock. One time isn't good enough. Keep on keeping on. Stay the course. That really is the answer to Christian living. That's the answer. Keep on. Keep on. When you don't like what's going on around you, keep on worshiping God. When you don't feel like you've got the answer you deserve, keep on giving God praise. When things are just not right, go to Him and seek Him out in prayer. You just stay the course. Because then the song that we sing will become your truth. I'm going to see a victory. See, we always try to define how long the valley of the shadow of death is. Sometimes it's just a hop, skip, and a jump. You're right through it. And then sometimes it feels like, my goodness gracious, I've been here for a decade. We don't know. Everybody's valleys and trials and tribulations are different. But if we keep the faith and we stay the course, we all going to see a victory. We're all going to see a victory. See, we get so earthly minded, and I know I've talked to you about this before. We get all earthly minded and we're judging everything in the spirit by what's going on in the natural around us. Your natural might be falling apart, but yet you're sitting in the middle of it with a peace that passes all understanding and a joy that fills your soul and you just love Jesus better today than you've ever loved him before. Listen, friends, you found a victory. Because that's what matters. I've prayed for people to get healed and they die. Was it that God don't heal them? No, they got their victory. I was selfish. I wanted them to still be here with me on this side of eternity. That I could live life with them and joke and carry on with them. But they got their victory. They clo If they were right with Jesus, they got their victory. 
they close their eyes to pain and discomfort here on this earth and they open them up to the presence of an almighty God. They have their victory. We've got to stop judging things by what the news station in the world tells us. We are not of this world. What pleases the world shouldn't be the standard that pleases us. The heart desire of the world and the flesh should not be what the Christian is seeking after. Quite frankly, if that's what the world is running after, the church probably ought to run the opposite direction, to be honest. Because it goes into verse 9 here, and it says... What man is there among you that if your son asks for bread will give him a stone or asks for a fish and will give him a snake? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Listen, God's not going to send you something for your destruction. God's not sending destruction your way. He's God. He's creator. He don't tear down. He builds up. But now there is an enemy who what's he do? He steals, he kills, and he destroys. So when there's destruction in your life, don't give God credit for that. God's not destroying you. He'll build you up. Now, if you got sin in your life, he might spank you a little bit and clean you up. But that's different than destruction. Allie gets on to me all the time, but I'm just trying to live by the scripture here that I give my kids good gifts. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to set a standard high, you know. It says if, if an he- if, if a earthly father who is yet evil will give his kids good gifts, how much more? So the fact that my kids are a little spoiled be all right. She scolded me the other day. She says, you got to quit upsizing me in the drive through Because the kids will say, I want a milkshake. Or I want a slushy. I want a smoothie. And she'll say, no, you ain't getting one at all. We don't need that. We all need to lose weight. We're going home. We got water, tea, and lemonade at the house. We ain't getting it. And they keep on keeping on. And so mama will finally give in. Fine. We're going to pull through, but we're getting snack size only. And then I pull up to the window and I say, give me four larges. So now the kids won't even ask if she's in the car. You know what I mean? Don't even ask. Don't have, Daddy, can we go? We don't want that snack size mess that mama buys. We want them larges. Well, if I get joy out of upsizing mama in the drive through Do you really think God's going to pour out something that's going to bring your destruction? Me being a broken, undone flesh man. I know most of you think I'm a saint and I'm absolutely perfect and I have a halo. That's not a halo, that's a glare off my bald spot. No, I need Jesus just like you need Jesus. But I wake up in the morning and I seek him. And I do my best to hear his leading and guiding and directing. Surrender to him. But if I know how to be a good father to my kids, how much more is your heavenly father a good father to you? And so this morning, know that God hears the prayers and the cries of his people. He hears you when you cry out to him. But are you crying out to him? Oftentimes we're looking for answers to a prayer that we never prayed. Yeah, God knows what you need before you ever ask him, but he still wants you to ask. Have you ever watched your kids doing something? I love it all the time. Catherine, she's she's pretty good about it. But Cooper, he's my little man child. You know, all 55 pounds of him. And he thinks he can lift 255 pounds. And he's going to try it before he asks. He's going to break off the handle and two different shovels trying to pry something up before he comes and asks. 
But oftentimes I sit back and I'll watch and I laugh about it because I'm thinking I really should go help him. But I mean, he hadn't asked for it yet. And he's out there just working himself to death trying to do something that wouldn't take me a couple of minutes. How often are we like that with our Heavenly Father? He's sitting right here ready to help us, but we're trying to figure it all out on our own. And we've worked ourselves to death. We done broke two shovels. We out here got mama's rake over here going to tear it up too. And you're frustrated and irritated. And all the while you had to say was, Lord, could you help me? Lord, could you help me? Because he's right there to help. He is the ever-present help. But he wants you to ask. He wants you to ask. And so he's teaching this and talking about how we should ask continually, seek continually, knock continually. And that if we, being evil of the world, can be good fathers and give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father be good to us? Then it goes right into verse 12, just kind of out of nowhere. It says, therefore, ever how you want people to treat you, treat them the same way. Because this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you would that you would have men to do to you, do also unto them. And this ties in, well, in verses 1 through 6, it talks about it. And then I talk, taught on it a few weeks back, Luke six thirty eight about the measure that you use, tying in with do unto others as you'd have them to do unto you. Look, church, we want to have godly influence in our communities. We want to be able to declare the word and have people listen to us. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we've got to understand that a lost, broken, and undone world People who are enslaved to sin, they're not wanting to hear the word of God. Now, am I telling you that we're not going to give them the word? No, you've got to give them the word of God. We're called to do that. We've got to declare Jesus to them. But how? How are we delivering it? Are we beating them about the head and wondering why they won't accept it? Or are we extending the grace to them that we really want God to extend to us? Not excusing sin. Don't hear me saying I'm excusing sin. I'm talking about when I'm in one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Am I going to stand here and snarl at them? And be self-righteous and judgmental and mean-spirited? Well, that's really going to go over well. Or... You know, look, I, I understand, I, I hear you, yeah, 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 I hear you. Did, you know, I was there one time. Most of the time when you say that, they say, say what? Oh, yeah, yeah, I humble yourself and testify of the goodness of God. And I've not hardly had anybody who wouldn't listen to my testimony. But now when I come to them and they're sitting there, you know, trying to defend their sin and I get all mad and frustrated and be like, well, the Word of God says it, so if you don't do it, you're going to hell. Well, what I said was the truth, but they didn't hear none of it. They didn't receive any of it. Goes back into how do you want people to treat? When all you do is sow kindness and mercy and graciousness, that's what you're going to reap. And so you may have people who hate your guts, but they can't get mad at you because the Spirit is working against them. But if you give them ammunition, no wonder they're having your lunch. But if we're walking in upright integrity and character, and we really are being Jesus to people, when we really have the fruits of the Spirit evident in our life, Scripture tells us that against these things there is no law. 
They ain't got nothing to say against us. They can't say nothing against us. And what that does is opens up the door wide that we can just walk right in and declare the word. And there ain't nothing they can do to shut you down because you've not given them ammunition to close the door in your face. Why are you talking about that? Because we're going to go into verse 13 here. It says, Enter at the narrow gate, for wide the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who are going through it. Because small is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We need to be hopeful. And we need to minister to every soul. Because it could be the next soul that accepts God. But also, Scripture's a good balancing act. You can take things and go way too far this direction, and you can go way too far that direction. That's the beautiful thing about being full gospel, is you've got to take the whole word and weigh it against itself and find that healthy tension that will pull you right back to the middle of the road, because that's probably where God intended for you to be anyway. And so, yes, we're going out to the highways, the hedges. We're being kind to everybody. We're loving on everybody. We're preaching Jesus to everybody. But then also, don't be surprised when nobody's responding. Because it's not that the power of God is not available to save them. It is there's hearts that don't want to receive what the power of God is trying to convict and deliver them to. Broad is the way. Big is the gate that leads to destruction. But the way, the path, the gate that leads to eternal life, it is a narrow path. It's a small gate. And few are there that find it. So I, I think it's kind of funny, you know, doing the outreaches and knocking on doors. It's like, you know, you knock on 25, 30 doors and we really only had a good connection with one. Praise the Lord. Scripture tells us there ain't going to be a whole lot on this road anyhow. Be thankful that we run into somebody. Have you ever been on one of them dark country roads before and you know you're on the right road but you start getting nervous because you ain't seen nobody in 15 or 20 minutes? It's like, where am I going? I mean, I know where I'm going, I think, but I'm starting to get, because, I mean, come on now, there ain't nobody behind me. I ain't met nobody. I ain't even seen the police on the side of the road. I'm st- am I driving into the oblivion, you know? And then you see those headlights of somebody. It's like, whoo, praise the Lord, the bridge ain't out. You know what I mean? There is somebody coming down this road. Well, really, that's how it's going to be on this walk. There's few on it. There's few on it. I'm not sitting here saying we're going to preach any less, evangelize any less. No, I'm just telling you, you got to preach and evangelize even the more because there ain't going to be that many who truly accept it. It's kind of like the McDonald purpose. McDonald's can only make, they can afford to make 10 cents on a cheeseburger because they're going to sell a billion of them today. Rabbit Patch, they need to make $3 a burger because they ain't going to sell but 100 of them today. You see what I'm saying? Well, we're kind of like McDonald's. We need to hit a billion of them because we know ain't a half a dozen of them will actually accept what we're saying. We've got to shotgun blast this thing. So don't let the enemy use facts to get you twisted because the church will get mad and quit. We've been doing all this. We've been knocking on doors. We've been ministering. We've been witnessing. We've had evangelistic rallies. We do this. We do that. I mean, we're just doing all this and just people just ain't wanting to get saved no more. Bible says there ain't going to be too many of them that do. I think that's what COVID did to us and and the shutdowns. I really do. I think it purged the church. I think that's why so many churches are so much smaller than they were because all the fakes got out. Yeah, but there's some churches that used to have a thousand. Now they only have a hundred. Well, <laughs> that's probably the truth. What but a hundred of them saved. The rest of them was just there looking. It's not a pretty picture, but it's probably the truth. And so we're post COVID and you're sitting in church, so see? Praise the Lord. And yes, I said we're post COVID. Because God's good. And he's faithful. So understand, church, 
that there's always going to be more against us than are for us in the natural. But the beautiful thing is, if God be for us, it don't matter who is against us. Skip over to verse 24. It says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. See, there's a clause. You can't just come and hear the word. you got to do it too. It says, I will liken them to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and its fall was great. It's hard for me to read this passage without singing the little song I used to sing in uh, VBS, you know, the the wise man builds his house upon the rock. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, the floods came up. That's what my mind is saying while I'm trying to read this to you. So I'm saying, no, and... (laughs) Let me, let me point something out here. The Lord's ministered to you this morning. I pray this word is doing something for you. The wise man built his house upon a rock, a firm foundation, a solid foundation, because he heard and did the word. But the rain still came, the flood still rose, and the wind still blew. The beauty is... The house stood. The foolish man, he heard, but he didn't do. And the same rains came, and the same floods rose, and the same wind blew, but his house fell, and great was the fall. So church, hear me plain. Just because you are a doer of the word doesn't mean you are exempt from a bad rainstorm, high floods, and a hard wind. The beautiful thing is, and the promise of God is, is if you have got your house planted firm on the rock, the foundation of the Word of God, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, it don't matter how hard the rains come down. It don't matter how high the floods get. It don't matter how hard the winds blow. Your house will stand. It will stand. So some of you might be in the middle of your rainstorm. Some of you may feel like it's time to swim because the floodwaters is so high. I'll just ask you a simple question. Are you doing the word? If you're doing the word, take comfort knowing that your house is on firm foundation. And no matter how bad this storm gets, you will not fall. But now if you just play in church and you're not doing the word of God, friend, it says great is the fall. Great is the fall. So now it's your responsibility to weigh that out. Allow the Spirit of God to minister to you and to speak to you. Am I doing the Word of God? And if you can with your soul honestly answer yes, then I want you to be encouraged that your house will not fall. But if you've weighed out those questions and you say, I'm not sure. But it's time you get some things in order. Because there is not a promise for you. Actually, it says, actually, your destruction is going to be great. It's going to be horrible. Great fall. That means great loss. Total loss. An absolute catastrophe. We must do the word. Whoever hears these sayings that we've now walked through over the last several weeks and does them. Whoever hears these sayings and does them. You have a promise. Just as we sang before I took the pulpit, I'm going to see a victory. So this morning as you stand, yeah, Yeah, come on, 
Worship team, if y'all will, come on back. I want to give you an opportunity to find yourself in the presence of the Lord to answer the questions posed to you this morning. I know you've heard the word. Are you doing them? And if you're one who may be being honest with yourself, say, no, no, I'm not doing the word of God. I love God. I love coming to church. But I've just not fully surrendered. There are things the Lord's told me to do that I'm not doing. Today's your day of salvation. Saying I'm not going to heaven, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that you're on a path that has promised a great destruction. And all it takes is a heart that's repentant and saying, Lord, I'm hearing you and I'm choosing today, I'm declaring today that I am going to be a doer of the word. I am going to build my house up on the firm foundation of your word so that I may be safe from destruction. Amen. Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.